TV might be the most popular American pastime. One study shows that on average, 55% of Americans spend one to four hours each day watching TV, and 22% watch four or more hours each day. And to be sure, 2022 has been an intriguing year for series and shows with a bumper crop of choices. Jeffrey Brown looks at the year in TV for our arts and culture series, Canvas. No one can possibly watch everything broadcast and streaming these days, but we have two critics who do their best. They join me now, Lorraine Ali of the Los Angeles Times, Eric Dagens of NPR. Welcome back to both of you. Nice to see you. Lorraine, why don't you start? Give us two or three of your top picks of the year. Well, my top pick is Severance, and it is a dystopian kind of workplace nightmare, psychological thriller um, on Apple TV+. Plus. It follows the employees of this mysterious place called Lumen Industries. I give consent to sever my memories. And these employees can have their personalities severed. One half of you goes to work, the other half goes home, and they do not remember one another. And so all sorts of kind of mysterious things happen within this bifurcated world. It is thrilling, but it is also incredibly eerie and creepy, and it will make you feel really good about your own workplace, because like, there's nothing that could be this bad. Oh, we all, everybody needs that. That sounds good, yeah. I really love Pachinko, um, and it is a drama, Apple TV Plus again, and it is about a Korean family, four generations, and following them from the Japanese occupation all the way through to the immigration to America, beautifully shot. And it's the women that really push this story forward, and I think that is like one of the best dramas of the year. I'd also like to bring up Wednesday, which is a dark comedy on Netflix, and it follows Wednesday Adams, yes, of the Adams Family, played by Jenna Ortega. This comes from the mind of Tim Burton, and it is just fantastic in so many ways. Dark, sarcastic, it really captures this teen angst through Wednesday Adams, and it's really kind of the the teen drama or the teen comedy I wish I had when I was in high school for all us girls that like didn't really fit in because we weren't perky enough. <laughs> all right, <laughs> Eric, can you top top that? I, I don't know if I can top that. You know, I'm not gonna try to top Lorraine because uh, first of all, I'm a co-sign on Severance. I love that show. My top is gonna be Better Call Saul, the AMC series and a spinoff from Breaking Bad featuring sort of the origin story of the uh, sleazy lawyer Saul Goodman. Nice. The people who made Breaking Bad really perfected their storytelling techniques on Better Call Saul, and they created this story that told us about the making of this character and also what happened uh, after breaking after the events of Breaking Bad uh, when the cops sort of descended on this meth-making operation and Saul Goodman had to go into hiding. Very subtle, very sophisticated, and also a way of sort of going back and rewriting some of the story of the other Breaking Bad characters. So I love that show. I am a Star Wars and Star Trek nerd, so I want to talk about a show from the Star Wars universe called Andor, which is a show starring Diego Luna as a, a rebel leader that we also saw in the movie Rogue One. And again, this is sort of his origin story, how he came to be part of a rebel alliance that would challenge the evil empire from the Star Wars movies and indeed how that rebel alliance actually was formed. It's about um, these people seeing a fascist government slowly take over um, a representative government and how that rebel alliance forms to resist it. And it, there's a lot of, there's a lot of that can speak to today's uh, uh, times, I'll just say. And then my third one uh, would be Abbott Elementary, which is just an amazing comedy on ABC about a young teacher in Philly schools, a Philly elementary school. Jokes every five Five seconds and they're all funny the characters are amazing and it's a show that has um, you know three substantial parts for women of color for black women and they're all different and they're all dynamic and they're all essential to the story which is something you rarely see in network television Lorraine is there one that you know you just felt was overlooked and you find yourself still telling wanting to tell people at the end of the year you got to go back and look at this I'm so glad you asked because I love the Serpent Queen. Never trust a single soul. Historical drama that was on Stars and starring Samantha Morton. And it follows the 16th century ruler Catherine de' Medici. And essentially, she's gone down as a villain in history. She gets to tell her own story. And 
explain how she became the woman that she is and how she gained so much power. Samantha Morton is just captivating. It takes this historical drama, but it also has this overlay that is really gritty and really raw and very punk rock. And I just love it. I cannot recommend it enough. I want to end by asking about something we've been talking about over the years, you know, about prestige television and then pandemic viewing. And there's a lot of uh, big questions now, I think, about where we're at, about the viability of creating new programmings. Lorraine, is there plenty more to come? Is that your sense? Or is the era of peak TV over? I haven't seen that. Um... I see plenty of great uh, content out there. There's more this year than there was a year before, than there was a year before that. I don't see a drop in the quality. I see um, much more creativity. There's so much out there. It's challenging. Each production's challenging the other to up, to up, to up the quality. And so I don't see that we're at a place where, uh-oh, you know, we've used up all the creativity we've had. I think we're in a great place, and I see more to come. Eric, what do you see? What I see is that streaming, which has fueled a lot of this, is moving from its infancy into its adolescence. The era of the House of the Dragon or uh, Rings of Power level series where they spent tens of millions of dollars on every episode, uh, that is going to happen less and less. We're going to see a little less content because Wall Street is starting to question whether it makes sense to spend all this money on these platforms that may never make money. And there's also a sense that there's only going to be two or three big platforms that really emerge as profitable winners when the dust settles. And so there's a fight on between Netflix and Disney Plus and Amazon and HBO Max, the major contenders, who, who are going to be among the two or three or maybe four that survive all of this. And then if you're smaller, uh, how do you get bigger? Uh, so that you can be among those uh, that survive. We're going to see a lot shake out in the next year. Consumers can't keep up with it, and Wall Street can't justify spending the money to make all those shows. All right. Eric Dagens of NPR, Lorraine Ali of the Los Angeles Times, thank you both again. Thank you. Thank you. I'm taking notes. I'm going to go watch all of those in coming days.